I am President Officer X. I served for 27 years at HMP Mays. I joined in 1974. Well, when I, when I worked in the wings in the Mays prison, uh, it come, it's blocks 3, 4, I worked in H blocks 7 and H blocks 8, which held, all held provisional IRA prisoners. It was constant harassment from even in the mornings to you came out at night. They would spat at you. They would have intimidated you by threatening you to blow you up on the way home from work or shoot you or threaten your family. And how would they threaten you? You know, would they approach you in the prison? Would they approach you outside the prison? Find out where you live? Well, these men would uh, do their level best to find out where you lived and nine times out of ten they would be successful in finding out where you lived. And they would then uh, put notices in papers, for instance, by announcing your death in the death notice of the newsletter. This is why the newsletter changed over the years that you had to identify yourself before you put in a death notice. Because provisional IRA men are putting in death notice for police officers and prison service. And you read, you read about your death the next morning in the newsletter. That's interesting. I wasn't actually aware of that. Well, that's true. When you're down the wings working with prisoners and they had a grievance, a grievance that, a particular grievance that day and they wanted to get back at you for some unknown reason only to themselves, uh, they would, five or six or six or eight of them would surround you in the middle of the wing and I was one asked you a question before you could answer that question and another one asked you a question and before you could answer that one somebody else would ask you another question totally unrelated to the first question. So that way then everybody was demanding your attention. So that was always a very sticky part because if you give the wrong answer, you'll never get a dig in the back of the head and you didn't actually see who done it. They, they would come up to you in the wing and they'd say to you, that's a nice box for your driving nowadays, or that's a nice Ford, Ford uh, Escort you're driving. The colour blue, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I believe it's a nice car. So therefore they're letting you know that they knew what you drove, and if they knew what you drove, they knew the number of your car, so they would have easily followed you and got to know you. Well, they would follow you at home from work, and uh, they would maybe use two or three cars in order to not, not show themselves up following you. They would maybe use the, uh, an escort to follow you for the first three or four miles, then would change the order. I don't have to think about being followed, I was followed on many occasions. And they would, the, the, the prison service uh, per, uh, security personnel will tell you to change your route on your way home. Never go home the same route. But unfortunately, when you got within a quarter mile or so of your own house, every route, no matter which one you took, led onto one route. Yes. And that one route. That one route led into your house. So therefore, it didn't matter in many ways you changed your direction. You, only had, you had to come home with one route only. And that was the route up to your front door. You couldn't change that. You took us through the Mays prison before. Um, there's a short video on the site. There's more video to go up of you taking us through with the camera. Um, you took us to a small tea room uh, where you said you made your fries and the microwave set. What would have been the mood in there and on the wing and general block the morning after or on a night guard? when an officer had been murdered or shot on the outside. What, what would have been the mood of the prisoners and the officers? You are come in the morning to the tide lights and somebody would said to you, did you hear about so-and-so we got shot last night and he's killed? Well, obviously, that dent the morale. Uh, you are coming in to go down a wing, uh, fill up uh, provisional IRA men, who you know were the instigators, of the, their mates were the instigators of the murder the, the previous night. You would have come into the block, they would have been quiet as well. They would not have been saying anything. They knew about the murder. And they would not have been saying anything at all. The place would have been really, really quiet. You obviously wouldn't mention nothing because if you're down the wing with 30 uh, prisoners and uh, 20 other murderers out there are all mass murderers, you didn't actually, you wouldn't, you, you're, you wouldn't have mentioned the fact to them that one of your mates was dead, you wouldn't want them to gloat in any shape or form. You're the, the odd one would have passed comment to you, 
But you can see in their faces that they were well aware somebody was killed and they were well pleased about it. Any time I was on the wings, I never was happy. Uh, I always thought that um, you were bond very vulnerable to attack. I respect of whether they were talking to you or whether they weren't. Um, on many occasions, I was surrounded by groups of prisoners threatening me. Uh, if you walked down and somebody was particularly friendly with you at the best of times and didn't speak to you, you knew something was going to kick off. Felt, they felt the mood, always felt the mood. And what about fear? Did you ever show fear? No, never show fear. Um, I mean, the the day I walked up the wing, and as I passed the door, steel doors would have slammed it just as you put two feet past it. But it got to the stage you wouldn't even jump. Because uh, one thing I would never do in a provisional IRA prisoner, and the same applied to, to, to loyalists, never show them with a prison. Because you shouldn't be a prison with, with a plate on it. So they were, they were really a plate on it and knew you were coming on the wing and knew I'd even be dropping a pin that would scare you. They would have played on it, and you know, we like what my boys living on the wings. But if you showed them you didn't care what they were doing, and just got on the job, ignored them, that's basically, uh, give them a, give them a, uh, you know, sort of, they would look like they said, well, no, you're scaring him, so he, he, does, he, he doesn't care. Well, there was many occasions, I mean, I was down the wings with, uh, her, uh, with the loyalist prisoners, and one particular chap who had a run in with in reception a few days earlier had threatened to, that he would see me, he would, he would get me the next time I went to his wing. And as it so happened, I was on his wing a few days later and he couldn't believe his luck. And he got his mate, whom I knew, and he came down and he said to his mate, he said to his mate there's that F and B there. And his mate looked at me and says, ah, that's only uh, forget about it. And walked right. off and his mate was there. And the prisoner had threatened me as an old dumbfound and he couldn't do that all because he was on his own, he was cart and he wouldn't take me on his own so he walked off in a huff. You knew once you entered the wing that the intimidation would start right away. You're constantly on a high, you, you never, the brain, once you get in, in, into the wings, the brain's took over because uh, you're fully aware that you could have been attacked from behind at any second. And the verbal, the verbal abuse, intimidation, just you know, on some days was just intolerable. There was one time that um, when I was doing uh, photographer around the prison, my job was to photograph prisoners to update their security books. When I was photographing this uh, well-known Republican prisoner, um, he didn't want his photograph taken. He told me and somebody was go away. But I insisted because uh, it was my job at the time to photograph these guys. Um, in the end, he reluctantly gave in and was photographed. But he told me in uncertain terms that he was, going to, he was due for at least actually in a, in a few days. And uh, he told me that he was going to shoot me. There's no doubt about it whatsoever. And I, I, knew, I knew quite well he would do. But as fortunate, fortunate for me and unfortunate for him, about a week after he got out, he was found floating in the Erie Canal, shot through the head. So that was one... Um, would be assassin of my life uh, eliminated. By the way, I didn't do it. 